Hello there, good evening and welcome to another edition of Democracy on the Threat. I'm your host, Eddie Lane, and I have with me in studio uh, this evening Dr. Frank Anthony. Dr. Anthony is a former minister under the People's Progressive Party Civic Government, um, a former member of parliament, and is also a candidate on the PPC's list. He's also a central committee member um, of the People's Progressive Party. Dr. Anthony, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much, Eddie, for having me on your program. Um, and I, I want to get straight into this because we have had a little bit of a break um, for a, a period um, since the elections, um, in terms of our programming to inform the public, uh, since the elections were held on the 2nd of March. Um, we are way past uh, probably six weeks or so already um, and we still haven't reached a conclusion. We haven't concluded those elections in terms of having uh, transparent results. Um, Dr. Anthony, your opening comments with regards to what we're in at this point. Well, I mean, I think this is unprecedented. Of course, this is the first time in the history again and perhaps in the Caribbean that you've had and elections where people went uh, and voted and up to now we cannot get the results of the elections. Um, there have been one excuse after another and the, there's been this prolonged delay uh, for declaring the results of the elections. Um, you know, we were at the office of the RO for Region 4 and we witnessed what went on there, and certainly what we saw was an attempt, a blatant attempt, at rigging uh, these elections because the way people voted and the use of the statements of poll, uh, people voted, it was summed up on the statements of poll, but then when it came to that RO's office, the RO refused to use the statements of poll that clearly depict how people voted and use something else that he manufactured. And obviously that was not reflective of how people voted and that, that resulted in a dispute. And so we cannot use Excel spreadsheets that were manufactured by the RO as the basis of how people voted. We have to get the authentic statements of poll um, and GCOM must use that. And that has been the fight that we have been engaged in for so long. Something very simple. Something that was done in all nine other regions of, that we have. So Region 1 did it with statements of poll. Region 2, Region 3, uh, Region 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The only region where they didn't do this is in Region 4. So obviously something is wrong, and it's not only the PPP that is saying that it's wrong that they're using, um, they're not using the statements of poll. The international observers have seen this. The other political parties that were there, the local observers. So everybody is asking why in Region 4 have they deviated? And the only reason would have to be that they're trying to steal the elections. So we have had a round of court cases and different things, and now we are hopeful that very soon that they'll commence the recount of the Region 4 uh, votes. And once we can get that done, I think we should have the declaration of the elections. So we are still hopeful, but this has going, been going on for too long. And frankly, I think the whole nation is fed up with this nonsense that GCOM cannot count a couple votes in Region 4. It's really, uh, I think it's getting on everybody's nerve now. That, and up to today, we are seeing the, the tricks of even further trying to delay this. Um, you, you, I mean, you imagine the audacity of the chief elections officer of even daring to bring a plan to um, the Commission to say that it would take 156 days to recount um, these votes. This is utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. And, you know, we should state it for what it is. It is another way of trying to delay the elections results. 
this is what really they're trying to do. And so we have to call it out and make sure that people understand that if we are not vigilant, that the PNC and some operatives in GCOM are likely to steal the election. So that's why we have to remain vigilant. Dr. Anthony, um, you made a couple of key points. One, you talk about the constant excuses that are coming from not only the Chief Elections Officer and elements in the Secretariat of GCOM, but also the excuses that are coming from people like Vincent Alexander and the others who are supportive of the coalition. Um, you also spoke about the fact that uh, the Chief Elections Officer seems to be finding all sorts of excuses. I understand that repeatedly he's seeking clarification. Every time the Commission meets, he, his only action is to go there for clarifications. Um, with regards to the recount and of course the, the five month plan, um, the 156 days, uh, just over five months I think it is. Um, but also we are seeing efforts to change the narrative. Uh, yeah. The, the APNU AFC, and before I bring you in, the APNU AFC has been maintaining all along that um, you know they won the elections and, and, and all sorts of things, but they've refused to release their statements of poll. They have um, Clearly, the international community, the ABE countries, um, the international observers, the local observers, mm -hmm. the private sector, every single, even to the religious community, have all seen the attempts to delay the results in one instance and also to change the results to some extent because they think that the world over has seen what happened. We saw recently the APNU AFC expending large sums of money to prepare a dossier mm -hmm. that I understand that they hire some big expensive company to take to Washington for lobbying. Let's talk a little about, about that. Well, uh, from what you have just said, um, a couple of things. If the PNC is so um, confident that they have won these elections, um, well, you know, I'm calling them PNC, but okay, they contested as APNU and AFC. If they're so confident if they, that they've won the elections, well then, come and let us count, recount the votes in Region 4, and let us do it as per the statements of poll. Now, we had polling agents at every single polling station in Region 4. So we have those statements of poll, the PPP garden. We proceeded after uh, GCOM was dilly-dallying and didn't want to um, show those statements of poll and so forth. We proceeded to publish ours on the internet. So every person in this country and elsewhere can go online and see those statements of poll and see those numbers. As of today, as we speak now, no one has disputed the numbers that were published by the PPP. So that's the first point. APNU and AFC also contested, and they are also in possession of statements of poll. Why is it that they are so reluctant to put out their statements of poll if they have won the elections? The fact is, they know they have lost the elections. And if they put out the genuine statements of poll, it would show that they have lost the elections. So that is the reason why they cannot publish their statements of poll, because it would show that they have lost the elections. So now they have resorted to playing this hide-and-seek game. Um, okay, let GCOM publish it. But GCOM does not want to publish the genuine statements of poll because we saw Mingo's action, instead of using genuine statements of poll, he came with a spreadsheet that he made up. Somebody sat in a room, plug in numbers, any child can go and, and make an Excel spreadsheet. They sat in some room and made up these numbers and then came and wanted us to accept those numbers. So that's not reflective of the will of the Guyanese people. That is something that Mingo and his cronies in GCOM manufactured. And so we cannot accept that. So what we have been saying all along is that when we go to count 
or when we go to recount, we must see GCOM produce the genuine statements of poll. The problem that the, the APNU and so have is that they cannot forge these statements of poll. Why? Because there are secret marks on the paper. And these statements of poll, the paper was printed, especially with these secret marks. And therefore, if they try to forge it, people would be able to detect it. Right? And that's their biggest problem. So that's why they had to resort to things like spreadsheet and so forth and not use the genuine statements of poll. So now because they have failed to convince anybody in Guyana that they have won the elections, even I think a lot of their supporters don't buy the argument that they have won this, these elections. Because if you know that you have the numbers, you would be the first one to agree, let's count it and clear this dispute. What has happened? They have been trying their best to try to delay and not have the things properly counted, right? So if you were a victor, if you won, you know you have the numbers, you would be anxious. Let's go, open those boxes. Let's see what is there. Let us get it done. No, they didn't want to have that done, right? And that attitude continues. So. In a lot of people's minds is that no they haven't won and all they're doing is clinging on to power now we the 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 thing is because the international community was in the room witness what went on right you have uh, the US government had representatives there they saw what went on the British government the EU the Canadians all these big and powerful countries were all there in the room and saw what went on. They have issued statements that were very clear that what went on in Region 4 was a travesty and that the votes weren't properly counted and they need a transparent way of getting these things counted. So what you have now is that the U.S. government over the last couple of weeks through very senior people in the U.S. government making statements, very strong statements, that if we do not have a recount of the votes in Region 4, that the officials that are involved and the people who would benefit from this action would receive sanctions, right? And so what we saw was a little backpedaling of the APNU and the AFC people trying now to say, well, okay, you know, we want to do this, but we don't want to do this, you know, and they're trying to now soften their position. And then, as if that was not enough, and, but they're still preventing the recount. They still have their agents there trying not to have the recount. And so as if that is not enough now, uh, we understand that they have now hired a big fancy uh, company in the U.S., I think it's called um, Omni Advisors. And this is a lobbying group in Washington. They're probably paying, I don't know, uh, millions of Guyana dollars uh, for this company now to go lobby the US government. And they're trying now to change the narrative. They have even put out a dossier, a dossier of the 2020 elections in Guyana. And what that dossier is trying to say they have rewritten the whole narrative to try to say that um, the elections were stolen from the government and they won the elections and all of that. But, and they, they, they tried to bust the dossier with some early statements that were made after the close of poll that, you know, um, things were going okay. What the dossier doesn't say is that after Region 4 was not counted, the reactions of the international um, observer groups, the reactions of the EU, the ABC countries, and so forth, they, that is absent in the dossier. So they're trying to go and try to maybe influence people to reverse maybe the US policy um, here in Guyana. But I don't think that is going to help them and prevent them from getting sanctions because everybody saw what it was trying to steal the elections so this 
action by uh, the APNU and AFC uh, of hiring this lobbying form and going out there and trying to uh, change the narrative, I don't think that's going to work for them. And I really don't understand why is it that if you're so confident that you have won the elections, and if that is a narrative that you're peddling now in this dossier that you have, why is it that you're afraid of opening those ballot boxes and let us count them? Or to release your statements of poll. That right, or release them. your statements of poll. Up to now, you can't get them to release the statements of poll, right? But they're paying millions of dollars to go to Washington to hire a company uh, to do this. You know, the millions that you're currently spending would probably be best spent on taking that money and spending it to get maybe the mask and the, the gear that people need in the hospitals because they have shortage of these things, the N95 masks, the surgical masks and so forth for the, the frontline workers, those health workers in the health system. They need those things. But instead of the government providing that, what they're doing, they're spending millions of dollars now trying to get a lobbying form uh, to go lobby for them in Washington to change the narrative that they did not steal the elections. Every person who was in that room saw what they were trying to do. Including the U.S. representative. Including the U.S. representative, including the Carter Center uh, uh, and a whole set of other people who were there. So I don't think you can erase that. And, and what is even more, uh, the general public has been following this. And there were videos that were coming out of that room. So it's not like anybody making up these things. There were people who were videoing these things and broadcasting it on the internet. So all those videos are out there. So I don't know who the PNC or APNU or AFC is trying to fool. This time for, for trying to fool Guyanese people is over. What we need is for us to have that recount now uh, as quickly as possible and declare the winner of the elections. We cannot go on like this. Right now, this country got a political crisis, we have a health crisis, and very soon, if we're not there already, we'll have a financial crisis. And all because of the incompetence of this group of people that is calling themselves a government. You, you mentioned the fact that uh the dossier that it was prepared um, and it talking about a whole host of things that I think um, because I've briefly looked at just the content page and I understand the headings under which they operated um, but you made the point that it captures what happened on elections day and I think there was a general consensus save and except for a few minor incidents like the Mon repo and the one at the West Bank that voting by itself went smoothly and I think the international community indeed recognized that. Um, but the fact that they, they ignore the statements that follow, statements yeah. not just from the, the ABE countries, ABCE countries, but also statements from the international observers like the European Union, the Carter Center, right. the OAS, and, and the Commonwealth. Um, and the fact now that they have changed the narrative to play victims. Um, today, the Organization of American States, even in the midst of this dossier, which they think can convince the, the people in Washington, released another statement, which they made some very, very strong points. And I right. probably I should share this before I ask you to comment um, on the statement. Um, they spoke, they gave a background as to what happened and the fact that the results right. released are not transparent. But I want to share this with the public and then I'll ask you to comment. The statement reads, and I'll quote this part, in particular, the mission, that is the OAS mission, requests GCOM take particular care to ensure that, one, the officials to be engaged in the recount are selected based on their impartiality, and those who have displayed partisan behavior are excluded. And I think this deals with the uh, main well, goals. Exactly. So maybe let's, let's take them one, one at a time. So that first one. We cannot go back to a recount, right, with the same officials being in charge because they would do the same thing, 
right? In the midst of when this count was happening, people were pointing out the discrepancies. They had an opportunity there and then to change and to do the right thing, but they insisted on doing the wrong thing. So we cannot go back to have a recount and then you have the same players in the room trying to, to thwart the process. So what the OAS is, is rightfully saying is that if you want the process to be credible, if you want the results of this recount to be credible, then you have to put persons in there that would be impartial. So Clement Mingo and company should not be there. You should have someone else who would be now uh, replace him as the arrow. And there are many persons who can do that. So the commission has the power to be able to replace these employees, right? Mingo is an employee of the Elections Commission and they can replace him. So he is not somebody that is there that you, you can't change, right? He can be replaced like any other employee of the commission and they should replace him, set him aside, and have somebody else there that is going to be impartial. And that's a quite a reasonable request to have. And I'm happy that the OAS would have made that statement because this is so important going forward. And I don't think the APNU and AFC should have any objection because if they want a credible process, they should also have credible people, people who, who have not been tainted to be in charge of the recount. The OAS also said on the second point they made that the duly authorized representatives of political parties and accredited observers are allowed to see but not handle the, each ballot. So, and that's, and that's fair. So every political party that contested the election must be allowed to have an observer and more than an observer, persons who are there to scrutinize uh, the results as they are being called. Uh, this is very important, right? Because again, that's where the discrepancy arose. You had the people from GCOM calling out wrong numbers that did not correspond with the statements of poll that the PPP and all the other opposition parties had, right? The only people who stayed quiet was the APNU and AFC, while every other party that was in there was protesting because of the wrong numbers. And the only people who benefited when those numbers were called was the APNU and AFC, because their votes got increased um, when these numbers were called. So it was clear who was the beneficiary. So for us to scrutinize the process, we need to have uh, persons from the political parties who would be there and to be able to scrutinize properly. Now, what happened in the last time? We had somebody sitting at a computer calling out numbers. They refused to display the statements of poll, uh, although we were told and the Chief Justice ruled that these statements of poll must be displayed. What you, have, what you can do in display. You can use a projector and put it up on the wall so everybody can see that this is a statement of poll. Uh, it looks like it, these are the numbers, and then we can check to make sure that the security features that are on that paper is the right security features and they have not been breached. Because that is one way that you can authenticate that this is a genuine statement of poll, right? So political parties must be in the room to make sure that this happened. Secondly, there are observers, neutral people, who should also be in the room because one would want to argue that as political people, we have our own interests. But let's have neutral people in the room as well. Local observers, international observers must be there to see when we raise an objection or if we see something is not going right and we raise that, then our objections must be tolerated and dealt with. Not just we raise an objection and then somebody ignore it and move on. 
it must be dealt with. And these neutral people, the international local observers, must be in the room to witness this. Because if we don't have people witnessing this, then anything can happen. And then it's my word against yours. And that is why the international observers are so important. We have had a history of having international observers. And when elections were rigged in this country, they call it out. And that's why we need them again. Because in these elections, they also call out what was going wrong in these elections. Two other points I want to raise that the OAS outlined that are very, very critical to this recount process and to bring some, some sort of, some sort of um, credibility to the elections are, and I'll, I'll read them together because they're interrelated. The other one says, an ascertainment is made as to whether the number of ballots cast corresponds with the number of persons recorded as having voted. And secondly, the results of the recount for each polling station is compared with the statement of poll signed by the presiding officer. And I think the two would go together yeah. and are, are two critical points um, to ensure that there is credibility. So one thing is that when, when people voted, uh, each polling station, uh, we know the number of ballots that was re uh, released to that polling station. And then at the close of poll, we know how many people voted. So we have to ensure that those numbers um, match, so to speak. Uh, we have had um, or we have heard of instances when X amount of vo um, ballot paper was released to a station and then suddenly there is a spike in the numbers that exceeded how much people actually voted at the station. So that is a very important point because if you have more people voting at a particular station than existed on the list of electors for that station, then something is grossly wrong there. And these things ought to be investigated. So that point is an extremely important one. The other one has to do with the statements of poll. And again, it's coming back. It's coming back to the statements. We need to make sure that we understand how people voted and you got to use the genuine statements of poll. Now, in a recount, what happens? We'll go back, you'll open those boxes, and you come back everything how people voted. Right? So you'll come back um, one vote for this party or two vote for this one and whatever, you go through back everything. And so you will know how people voted. So that's what a recount is. And, and um, if, if, if I think I get the point that the OAS is making here, is that since you've already had a count in uh, count in all the regions because the votes in region four were counted at the polling place right. the problem really arise when the tabulation of the various statements of polls so i think the point that the OS is trying to make is that if you open a box in region four for example mm. and you counted the votes and you said okay x party 40 y party 350 the x party 10 you must be able to use the statement of polls signed by the presiding yeah. officer on elections day to ensure that the they thing is a simple thing right but you know the people that we got there they just, they just model it up um, one every single polling station in region four we already know how much people voted at each polling station all this man clement mingo had to do was to add up all these different things. It's a simple thing of addition, right? And you add it up and then you know how much people vote for PVP, how much vote for APNU, how much vote for the other parties and so forth. Where the process went wrong is instead of putting the exact number that was on the statements of poll, he chose to put some number that he pulled out from thin air or something because those numbers were not corresponding. And therefore, when he did his addition, he come up with a far different number from what should have been the right number. And that's, that's the crux of the problem, right? 
So we need to fix that. And if, if we're going to use statements of poll, all you got to do is bring in genuine statements of poll and do the addition. And you compare. And, and you can do it in, 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 in two days if you, if you use these statements of poll. If we are going to go into the box and open the boxes and, and come back every single box, we can still do that and do it quite quickly. Using the same, because I think what the OAS is trying to guard against, Dr. Anthony, is the fact that there might be requests coming from um, people to have fresh statements of poll and they won't, you know, attempts to discard. But even, the even if, if, we, if the method that we are using is to go in to open the boxes, we can open those boxes and count every single vote that is in there and we'll know how much people voted at each box. All right? So that's not a problem. So we will have the numbers and we'll make sure that it's properly tabulated. So, but to, we don't need 156 days to be able to do that. This can be completed in, a, in quite a, a, a small amount of time, right? And the way that you do that is you have several stations. So instead of three stations or five stations or whatever um, Lowenfield is proposing, you can have several stations, maybe 20, 25 stations. And each one of them would have people observing, the political parties, you would have the um, foreign and local observers being present so that they can watch at each station, right? And you count. So you multiply the time and you're able to do that quite quickly. Right? So this nonsense of doing it um, almost one box at a time, one box at a time, uh, we can compress time by doing several stations. And I think um, that would be quite reasonable to do. I want to, to examine another issue because we have been going for about six weeks now, like I said, from the 2nd of March to, to now. Um, the situation, I think you touched on these points that we are now faced with um, a health crisis, um, that the COVID-19 pandemic um, has been taking its toll on, on Guyana as a, as a small population. Uh, we have a situation where the country is being locked into a political crisis, and we have a situation where the, the economy is going down, where people are struggling. On top of all of that, because we don't have a legitimate government as a result of the elections that were held on March 2nd, Guyana is facing problems. Already we saw the World Bank releasing monies for COVID-19 um, response for a number of countries, including in the Caribbean and South America. And Guyana, who made an application, was excluded. I think that's an indication somehow that the, the international funding um, agencies are not prepared to deal with uh, country where there, there is illegitimate, uh, legitimacy surrounding the government and there has been talk about sanctions from the international community. Let us talk a little bit about uh, the position that we are in now. Well, we are in a very precarious position because most countries, when you look at the course of this crisis that is, the world is experiencing, you will probably go from maybe a health crisis into a financial one and then a political one. We had a political crisis to begin with because of not being able to count the votes and all of that um, controversy that was generated by GCOM and the APNU and AFC cabal that you have there. So we started out with a political crisis and then we got it compounded by COVID-19. And what we have seen is a mismanagement of this whole health crisis that is unfolding. You have um, a lot more people who are probably infected. Because we have limited amount of uh, test kits in the country, we are not able to estimate the magnitude of the epidemic, and therefore, uh, we really don't know uh, what is the true scale of this epidemic. And to compound all of that, it was obvious that the government was not prepared because the frontline workers that needed to have what is called personal protection equipment they did not have enough. Things like the N95 mask and the gongs and all the other face shields and things like that, they did not have enough. So there's a mad scramble now to try to get some, but the people, the, the doctors who are in the hospitals got to deal with this. 
they don't have enough, right? So if you really uh, was preparing to manage this thing properly, you would have done differently, and they're not doing that. The regional hospitals are not prepared. We really do not have the kinds of health infrastructure to deal with a major crisis. The numbers that the government released, they were expecting to have 20,000 cases. That's one of the simulations that they run. 20,000 cases. And of, when you got 20,000 cases, they were estimating that we'll need about 200 ICU beds. We probably got about 14 um, ICU beds um, in the Georgetown Hospital. That's obviously not enough. So we haven't seen this um, epidemic peaked as yet. And with the measures that the government has taken so far, uh, you know, we don't know whether that would have a, a big effect on slowing the epidemic. But obviously some of the measures are, I, I already can't describe them. You have a mayor of Georgetown that is allowing people to come and shop at the market for one day for half day. What that does is put more people in the market in a, a confined period of time so that there will be more people in contact with each other. Obviously, whoever is giving them public health advice, <laughs> that's not proper advice, <laughs> right? And you've got other things like that that is going on. Um, so we need to fix those things. We have a minister who is in charge uh, of the health sector a so-called minister, that really doesn't understand how to deal with a, a pandemic, doesn't have the, the, the knowledge, the capacity to deal with anything like this, and she is the one in charge. And we have seen the blunders along the way. Then they created a task force. A task force is headed by another person who doesn't have the knowledge to deal with these health crises. And <laughs> We, we have seen the different uh, stakeholders trying to meet with the task force and cannot meet with the task force, right? You had, up to yesterday, you had a plane that came into Guyana to pick up American citizens and take them back to the U.S. There are more than 90 Guyanese stranded in the U.S. that want to come back home. They refuse to bring back those people, although the plane the people who were coming in was willing to bring those passengers, Guyanese citizens, back to Guyana. They refused to bring the citizens of this country back here. So what we have is people who don't really care for the citizens of this country. Since this crisis start, it looked like the, 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 they have gone into hiding, right? They're not even out there trying to help to make sure that you know people are comfortable and things are going well you can you can keep your social distancing but you don't have to be invisible <laughs> they have become invisible so what we have is a mismanagement of this particular crisis and then there's opportunism when people are in all these problems we are seeing a level of opportunism by players in this government we don't know what is going on with the um, Ocean View contract. They have now taken over Ocean View. Apparently, they are building a specialized um, hospital or care unit there. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, they should have been able to do that a long time so that we don't cross-contaminate the people going into Georgetown Hospital. So we should have had a separate institution a long time. But we have seen two years ago the India Auditor General report where the Ministry of Public Health had a special relationship with this Ocean View place. They rented rooms from Ocean View, paying whatever sums of money. Up to today, we can't get how much money they actually paid. And when the Auditor General went in to try to audit what was being stored here, the man said he couldn't audit the, 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 the things stored here because you had uh, wood ants nests and you had cockroaches and rats and all kinds of vermin running around the place and his staff refused to go into those rooms to audit what was there. Now that is the place we are now taking and re renovating uh, to make into a hospital. 
And the amount of renovation that I see going on there, it probably don't look like that place would be ready for another two months or so. Uh, so I don't know how useful it would be to uh, decant some of the patients that would need the services of that hospital, right? So you, you see, and, and how much money have they spent there? How much money? Up to now, we cannot get a disclosure of how much money they have spent there, right? And it's probably millions of dollars. I think somebody posed a question to Moses Nagamutu, and he skirted around the question because he didn't want to answer the question. And they're renting, apart from doing all this massive repair, they're going to pay a rent to the owner of the facility. So something is grossly wrong with the kinds of arrangement that they have gotten themselves into uh, with the owner of this facility. And we need to get these things clarified. So I feel that some people, although we have a health crisis that is very serious and a lot of people are going to get sick and a lot of people are going to lose their lives if we don't actively manage this, you have some people on the other hand who is hell bent on trying to make a profit uh, from the situation that we are in. And then to compound all of this, you have the private sector and other sectors have to send home workers because uh, they're not doing well in their businesses. And we don't have a social net. The government has not put anything in place to help people who now have been sent home because businesses have been closing. Even the workers, the sugar workers in Barbies, a government-owned entity, they have been sent home and the government has not put anything in place. So again, we, we are seeing um, the government managing in bits and pieces. They're not taking a comprehensive approach. And this has been the pattern because they're, you know, so incompetent. Uh, we have experienced that incompetence and, and this is what we have to deal with. But I want to bring you back to the issue of, um, because I think you, you missed that one, you spoke about the others, sanctions and the fact that the World well, Bank would have refused well, to... Well, exactly, that too, because right now, uh, they have applied to get some money from the World Bank, $5 million. They're not getting the money. And they're telling us all kinds of like, well, you know, we had first round and um, they didn't put us on first round, maybe we'll get second round. Well, be honest. I don't think the international financial institutions want to deal with Guyana unless we have democracy in the country. And that's, that's the bottom line. And if you are going to protract having the elections results being declared, then nobody is going to help you. And they must get that clearly in their heads. Because if they don't, this country is going to suffer serious consequences. But because we, we, we don't have the this? money. We don't have the money to go buy ventilators. We don't have the money to go buy the, the mask and all these things that are needed, right? And we haven't heard the government taking money to buy any of these things. Have you heard that? All that you're getting is private sector and other people trying to help out. They have not said how much money they have spent on getting masks or getting test kits. The test kits that we are currently being used now, you know where it came from? It came as a donation from wow. PAHO. And up to now, this government has not put a cent to go buy new test kits. So when this uh, 1,100 test kits finish, we don't have any more. And they probably already spent maybe about 200 or so of the test kits already. Right? So when this is finished, we don't have any more because this government in Ghana, they are and buy more. Well, um, and Dr. Anthony, you made the point here about the fact that there, seem, there seems to be no money to go and buy these things. You apply to the World Bank, the World Bank has not considered you. I think two sets of, of um, disbursements were made to countries already and Guyana was not included. And it's a direct, um, this is a, a perfect example of how sanctions will affect Guyanese because you're asking for money to take care of the average Guyanese who may be infected. Let us extend that now because the United States, um, Canada, the EU, Britain, everybody would have already said that unless their democracy can be restored in Guyana and there is a legitimate government, a transparent conclusion to the elections, then Guyana can face sanctions. Let us talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, this has been repeated ad, ad nauseum. 
about sanctions. And we just hope that the, the people who are holding up this process are listening. Because it's not going to be pretty. It's not only themselves personally, but their families and other extended members of their families who are going to be affected. So they must understand that. But there's also this uh, consequence, uh, or what you might call, um, what, what would happen to the population. And we are seeing some of the knock-on effects of that. Because if we don't get money to respond to this health crisis that we have, then the consequences are going to be dire if we can't have the things to treat patients in the hospital. What kind of people would we have in place there that don't understand these things and don't take action, wouldn't want to expedite getting the elections results out so that we can fix these things? If you are so genuinely concerned about the, the people of this country, then you would want to expedite this, have the results, and let us get back on the path of democracy, and let us get back on the path of resolving the problems, the health problems that we have here. They're really not helping. And the longer they cling on like this, and the longer they try to delay the recount, uh, it's the worse it's going to get for us. And I hope people are understanding this. And I, I, I hope that maybe some of their supporters, you know, who are, can talk to them because COVID is not going to affect PVP people alone. It's going to affect people across the board. And we have seen that already. We have seen that already. Everybody is vulnerable, right? It doesn't matter your age. It's just that some people might get it differently than others, but everybody can be affected. Each one of us is susceptible to this disease. So we need to make sure that we have people in there who can manage this health crisis that is unfolding. I want to I want to bring you to another point because earlier in the program we spoke about uh, the changing narratives of the coalition um, and attempting to find all sorts of excuses. One of the things that we see coming up very often and um, there are a lot of people out there who thought that because this conversation is coming from the coalition, this indirectly is a signal that they realize that they have lost the elections. And that conversation to which I'm referring is that of power sharing and shared governance. And you're seeing a lot of letters coming up nowadays and you're seeing a lot of statements coming well, up. Well, I mean, the PVP has a position and that has not changed. In fact, even before going into the elections, we have stated our position in our manifesto. That position is that we would like to see constitutional changes as well. We would want to think about new models of governance and all of that. But you know what? We can't do that in this climate. We can't do it when people are trying to steal in elections. What we need to do is do this thing stepwise. First, let us ensure that we have the recount, that we declare a winner, and that we put back this, this thing that we are calling free and fair election. We want to make sure that that is back there. Once we have a winner and we have a, a new government that is in place, then the new government would start talking about how, what methods can we use, what models of governance can we have, you know, perhaps set up a constitution, a review commission or something that can genuinely look at what aspects of the constitution we wanted to change. The last major change that happened to a constitution in this country was led by the PPP. We had a 20-man commission that was, uh, well, a 20-person commission that was established. And you had uh, people who were represented there, uh, political parties, you have civil society people who were all there. And in that particular um, commission, close to 200 and something recommendations were made, some of which was already implemented. So we are not afraid of going out there and canvassing people to get an understanding of what changes they would like to see in the Constitution, right? But those things cannot take place now. We are in a crisis. We need to settle this this election crisis that we have on our hands 
And the only way that we can settle that is that we have to get this recount of Region 4 votes. And once we finish that, declare the results and let us have a new government sworn in. After that, let's then talk about the governance and what model. So that's the PBP position. And I think that's quite a reasonable position to have, right? All this nonsense that you, you got all kinds of political pundits now train up there and they want to do this and they want to do that and ignore the, the, how people voted and so, all of that is nonsense. If we pander to that kind of thinking, then why have any elections? And of course, that would not be a democracy. So those persons who are peddling those lines, I don't think they have the interests of this country at heart. What they have is their personal interests. And they have, you know, they want to protect that personal interest. It's not about protecting the collective. It is about protecting, um, you know, whatever they would have accumulated. We have to go beyond that. We have to be able to create a country where everybody can benefit and we can realize prosperity for everybody, not for some people. And that is what we have to move away from. And what we have seen playing out over the last uh, couple of years is where some people want to hog the benefits for themselves. Their slogan about a good life was only for one set of people, right? And now the, the, the other slogan that they were campaigning with in the elections honesty, about decent. decency and honesty. Well, who is decent? And who is honest now? We have seen that being depicted by what is going on right now. Because if they were truly decent, then we would have had these results a long time. If they were truly honest, we should have had these results a long time. And this country would not have been where it is today because of the, the machinations of this cabal that you have in the APNU and AFC. Where are the decent voices? Some of them used to hold out themselves as being reasonable voices and voices of reason. Where are those voices now? How can they look the people of this country in their face and really say to them that we are fighting genuinely on your behalf? They can't. And I guess that's why they have now become invisible men and women. In, in closing, um, Dr. Anthony, Guyanese, regardless of, uh, of the well, majority of Guyanese, regardless of which political party they supported in those elections, are frustrated, are becoming extremely wary of what is happening in the country because it's impacting them directly. Um, and I'm speaking specifically to the political situation in the country. What do you want to say to Guyanese across the board in this country um, with regards to a resolution um, of this crisis? This, what we are in right now, we can resolve it very quickly. We have to get a, a GCOM that is more decisive, a chairwoman that is more decisive. We have to start this process very quickly. Once we start this process and accelerate how we are doing it, not this 156 days nonsense, but a shortened timetable. Get the international observers in here so that we can get the results out. Once we have that, we declare who is the winner. You swear in a president, you have a new government, and let that new government with the legitimacy now be able to manage the crisis that we have on our, on our hands. So we'll put an end to the political crisis that we've had over the last year and a half or so that has been going on in this country because this goes back since a no confidence vote. So we can put an end to the political crisis and we will be in a former position to deal with the health crisis that we have in our hands. And of course, we will be able to open up um, sources of resources that can come into this country to help this country grow and to fix the problems that we have. That's the only way. The longer that we, we protract and we delay, it is the worse it's going to be for us. So the, the people who are trying to do this, to delay this process, is not helping us. And hiring a form in America to try to maybe create a better image of themselves, that too would not help. Because I think people understand and they've known the truth 
because they have been in the rooms and they have seen what went on. And I don't know how they are now going to try to brainwash people to say, well, what you saw is not what it is. I don't know how they're going to brainwash people. So I'm optimistic that we can fix the, the, the various problems that we have right now, but we need to have decisive action. And once we can get that decisive action, we will see that change coming in the next couple of months. So we need decisive action within, like, by next week from GCOM. And then we can have, you know, be able to resolve some of the problems that we have right now. Dr. Anthony, I want to thank you very much for joining me this evening to discuss the current situation in our country. Um, we are in a political crisis and I think we're heading very, very fast to an economic crisis um, as a result of the political stalemate um, the delay in the declaration of uh, or the credible declaration of results of the elections coupled with the um, novel COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, sorry, or COVID-19, which is also impacting our country. We want to um, encourage all of you to continue to, to uh, follow what is happening with the coronavirus. Um, of course, practice social distancing, uh, practice proper hygiene in terms of washing your hands with soap and water for no less than 20 uh, seconds. Ensure that if you have absolutely no reason to come out on the road, to stay home and stay safe. Protect yourself and protect your family. Dr. Anthony, I'll give you the closing comments with regards to COVID-19 before we go. Well, it's a serious disease and um, as we know, people can get infected. We don't know how many uh, persons who don't have symptoms are walking around. So potentially anybody can be carrying this disease. Uh, so you have to be careful. There are a percentage of people who would really get sick and those typical signs would be a fever, a dry cough, and then if you get shortness of breath, you probably need to go see a doctor. So it is important that you stay, stay, you, you stay safe and um, once you take those precautions of hand washing and your social distancing and wearing a mask, um, you should be fine. But you have to take those precautions. Um, we, 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 we can't just feel that somehow we are immune. We are not. And um, once we do that, we'll protect ourselves, we'll protect our families, and hopefully we can get through this um, novel coronavirus that is passing through Guyana, we can get through it safely. So stay safe and, um, and let's be vigilant too with what is happening politically. I think some of the people in the APNO and AFC are hoping that we would just be so concerned with the coronavirus that they will get free pass and trying things at the, at the political level. So we have to watch them carefully and we have to make sure that we are vigilant and that we keep fighting for our democracy in this country. Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Anthony. Remember, to um, if you're going out to wear a mask, if you don't have a mask, you can't get access to one. You need to look out for the Dr. Irfan Ali's Caravan of Hope. Um, I would want to call it that maybe coming to your community to distribute masks uh, to persons so that you can protect yourself. So until next time, we want to say thank you very much for being here, Dr. Anthony, again, thank you for joining me. Thank have you a very good much for having me. Bye for now.